Hello dear students, in this session we discuss about volumetric analysis under module 5. As of now in the module 5 we discuss about water chemistry, under water chemistry uh, we understood about basic parameters with respect to water quality, then we discussed about COD, determination of COD, hardness of the water. Then under chemical analysis, we concentrated upon instrumental methods of analysis and here we discuss about what is called as volumetric analysis. Volumetric analysis under this particular concept, what are all the things we are going to study, what are all the things we are going to understand, we will, we will see now. Under volumetric analysis, we just uh, go through the introduction first. What do we mean by volumetric analysis, why we call it as volumetric analysis we try to understand. Then we go through certain principles which govern volumetric or titrimetric analysis. Volumetric analysis is also called as titrimetric analysis. So therefore, we go through certain principles which are, uh, which are governing the entire concept of titrimetric or volumetric analysis we understand. Then we go through what are the requirements of, we try to understand what are all the requirements in order to carry out volumetric or titrimetric analysis accurately we discuss. Then what are all, what do you mean by primary and secondary standard solutions? What is meant by primary standard solution? What are its requirements? What is meant by secondary standard solutions? We will be understanding. Then we go through certain units, certain terms and meanings of certain units because in volumetric analysis, while carrying out volumetric analysis of any chemical sample, we frequently use many terms like normality, molarity, molality, mole fraction, ppm, etc. So what are the meanings of these uh, terms and un under what conditions, under what situations we are going to use these terms. Sometimes uh, to, uh, to indicate the concentration of any chemical solution, we may use molarity, some other time we may use normality, sometime we may use molality, etc. So under what conditions we use different terms in order to indicate the concentration of solutions also, we will be understanding. Therefore, overall at the end of this session under volumetric analysis, we will be having a fair idea about what volumetric analysis is, why it is called as volumetric analysis what are all the basic requirements to carry out volumetric analysis accurately or efficiently and uh, what do we mean by primary standard solution, why it is required. Then what are all the important terms we use in carrying out volumetric analysis. These are all the things we will be discussing, these are all the things we will be having fair idea at the end of this discussion. Now, Volumetric analysis or titrimetric analysis is used mainly in quantitative analysis. That means quantitative estimation. That means what? You will be given with a chemical solution, chemical sample solution, chemical species solution. You will be knowing which chemical is present. You have to find out only how much of the chemical is present. That is why volume that is that kind of the estimation is what we call as quantitative estimation. We are finding out the quantity, we know which chemical is present. For example, uh, through volumetric analysis we can uh, find out the percentage of iron in the given hematite sample. We can find out the percentage of copper in the given brass sample. So you know that in the sample iron is present, you know that hematite sample is only given to you. Hematite is one of the ores of iron, therefore you know iron is present there, but you do not know how much of the iron is present, you do not know the quantity. By carrying out volumetric analysis, by with the help of volumetric analytical method or titrimetric analytical method, you are finding out the quantity of iron present in the given hematite sample. You are finding out the quantity of copper uh, present in the given uh, brass sample. Similarly, you are finding out the hardness of water right? You will be given with some hard water sample. You know water is hard. Therefore, you know that 
in that hard water sample salts of calcium and magnesium are present therefore you know what is present there but you don't know how much is present you are finding out the quantity how much is the hardness how much is the cod so these kinds of estimating estimations are called as quantitative estimations and volumetric analysis or titrimetric analysis is used in used this kind used in uh, such kind of quantitative estimation of the concentration of chemical species as present in a solution you will be given with certain solution you have to find out how much of the cell uh, species present in that particular solution you may be given with a hematite solution you have to find out the amount of quantity of iron present in the solution similarly you will be given with the uh, some wastewater solution in that you have to find out what is the cod of the wastewater solution and so on therefore volumetric analysis or titrimetric analysis is used in quantitative estimation of the chemical species present in a given chemical solution and usually during volumetric analysis we carry out a chemical reaction between two different chemical species or two different chemical solutions one of the reactants therefore there are two reactants there two reactants mainly two reactants there one of the reactants we will be taken in a long graduated glass tube called as burette and it is commonly called as titrant so in volumetric analysis or titrimetric analysis it's nothing but because this volumetric analysis you have done in your classes already in your, in your earlier classes also so it is nothing but titration technique in it is nothing but titration experiment or titration technique and in titration what we do one solution we take in the burette another solution we take in the conical flask the solution we take in the burette or the chemical species we take in the burette is generally called as the titrant whichever the solution we take in the burette is generally called as the titrant and the second solution or the second reactant we take in the conical flask this is generally called as an analyte or it's also called as titrand the solution which is taken in the burette is called as titrant whereas the solution which is taken in the conical flask is called as titrand it is also called as analyte analyte or titrand okay and what we are trying to do generally the solution taken in the burette is going to be the standard one the solution was concentration we want to find out was uh, uh, the solution where uh, whichever the element present in the solution was concentration was quantity we want to find out that will be taken in the conical flask and that means we are trying to find out the or estimate the quantity of the analyte we are trying to estimate the quantity of the analyte the quantity of the analyte estimation of the quantity of the analyte is completely based on the volume of the titrant consumed during the course of the process i repeat once again the estimation of the analyte is completely dependent upon the volume of the the volume of the titrant volume of the burette solution or the titrant consumed during the course of the titration therefore this kind of the analysis is what we call as or this kind of the analysis is what we call as volumetric analysis or volumetric titration i repeat once again that we want to estimate the analyte we want to find out the quantity of the analyte present in the given chemical solution that is taken in the conical flask and the estimation of the analyte is completely dependent upon the volume of the titrant consumed during the course of titration therefore this kind of the process is what is called as volumetric titration or volumetric analysis volumetric titration or volumetric analysis this is the reason we call this entire process entire kind entire this analytical technique as volumetric analysis volumetric analysis now we understood that during volumetric analysis or titrimetric analysis it's also called as titrimetric analysis because through titration we analyze the analyte right during volumetric analysis or during titrimetric analysis 
we carry out a chemical reaction between two chemical species, two chemical reactants or two chemical solutions we can say. And one of the solutions, out of these two solutions, one of the solutions will be of known concentration. And all of you know that a solution of known concentration is always called as a standard solution or other way around a standard chemical solution is the one whose concentration is known to us and concentration we express in terms of normality, molarity, molality, etc. So, out of these two chemical reactions, chemical solutions we use during volumetric analysis, one of the solutions concentration will be known to us. One of the solution is of known concentration and therefore, it is called a standard solution and this standard solution is generally usually are commonly taken in the burette. That means, titrant will be generally a standard solution. Out of these two chemical solutions, one of the solution is a standard solution whose concentration is known to us. Generally, the standard solution will be taken in the burette or will be taken as a titrant. Whereas, another solution of unknown concentration, we have to analyze that. We have to analyze that. Another solution of unknown concentration it will be taken in the conical flask as a analyte, as an analyte and we have to analyze that and we have to find out its concentration. And during the process as all of you know, you have done this in the laboratories already. What we do is, you we fill the burette with the standard solution. Another unknown solution, analyte, we pipette out known volume of the analyte into a conical flask, into a conical flask, right. Then what we do, into the conical flask, we will be adding the solution from the burette and we carry out the reaction. We add the solution from the burette into the solution taken in the conical flask along with the continuous swirling or shaking of the flask, thereby facilitating the occurrence of the chemical reaction. And this process is what is called as titration. Titration is the process where solution taken in the conical flask is allowed to react with the solution taken in the burette by adding solution from the burette into the conical flask slowly. And this is called as titration and this titration must be carried out slowly, carried out slowly, not very slowly, in a reasonable speed we have to carry out the titration because uh, the why we call it, why we say the titration to be carried out slowly because uh, that too in the first trial, if we are very rapidly carrying out the titration, sometimes without our knowledge, we may cross the end point. That is the reason titration is generally carried out at a normal speed. Uh, that too in the first trial, bit slower. And equivalence point or theoretical end point or stoichiometric end point of the titration is the when, one where the analyte taken in the conical flask is completely reacted with the solution added from the burette. That, that point is what we call as equivalence point, theoretical end point or stoichiometric end point of the titration. That means what? Suppose you are taking a known volume of the analyte into the conical flask. Suppose you are taken 25 ml of the analyte into the conical flask. To that 25 ml of the analyte or 25 ml of the chemical solution whose concentration we need to find out, to that 25 ml we will be adding the standard solution from the burette. We will be adding titrant from the burette and the exact amount of the exact amount of the titrant which is required to react completely with the 25 ml of the analyte solution taken in the conical flask, when that point is reached, that point is what is called as the equivalence point, theoretical end point or it is also called as stoichiometric end point of the titration. Therefore, theoretical end point or equivalence point or stoichiometric end point of the titration is the one where the reaction between the titrant and the analyte is completed or other way around when the, the, the stoichiometric end point of the titration or theoretical end point of the titration is the one where we add exact amount of the titrant which is required to react completely with the 25 ml or whichever the amount of 
analyte taken in the conical flask that is what is called a theoretical end point, stoichiometric end point or equivalence point. Generally during the conductance of any titration experiment, the end point of the titration is indicated by the color change or is signaled by or indicated by color change, uh, color change occur occurring during the course of the titration in the conical flask that will be carried out by taking the help of indicator. So, generally in majority of the almost all the titration experiments, most of the titration experiments that too in volumetric analysis we take the help of the indicator. Therefore, in the conical flask along with the analyte we add small amount of 2 to 3 drops of indicator if it is in the liquid state. If it is in a solid state we take a pinch of the indicator the indicator helps us to find out the end point, helps us to find out the exact end point of the process through the color change, through the color change. And this point is what is called as end point of the titration, where there are only some experiments, some volumetric titration experiments, where one of the reactants, generally the analyte may itself act as a indicator that is what we call a self indicator. So, that it may itself may uh, involve in the appearance of the color change except those kinds of the volumetric titrations in all the other volumetric titrations we will take the help of the indicator. Therefore, end point of any titration is indicated by the uh, appearance of color change during the course of titration. This is being carried out by taking the help of a chemical species called as indicator. So, therefore, overall it during the carrying out of volumetric titration experiment what we do? We take the standard solution in the burette called as titrant and the analyte solution a known volume of the analyte solution is taken in the conical flask and we carry out a titration by adding solution from the burette into the conical flask along with the swirling of the flask. And in order to find out the end point completely uh, accurately, we take the help of the indicator. Indicator helps us to find out the end point by showing the color change exactly at the completion of the reaction. So, completion of the reaction or the end point of titration is nothing but the completion of the reaction between the titrant and the analyte. Completion of the reaction between the titrant and the analyte is nothing but the uh, nothing but the situation where the exact amount of titrant is added to the conical flask which is required to react completely with the known volume of the analyte taken in the conical flask. That is what we call as end point, theoretical end point or stoichiometric end point. This end point or the completion of the reaction can be easily identified with the help of the indicator. And once we find out the end point, what we know here? We know what is the exact volume of the titrant which is required for the completion of the reaction. That is what is called as end point of the titration. And from that volume of the titrant and for the titrant we also know its concentration because titrant is always a standard solution taken. A standard solution is the one a standard solution is the one whose concentration is known to us. Okay. So, therefore, once we complete the titration experiment from the volume of the titrant consumed during the titration and we also know the concentration, we can easily calculate the amount of the substance present in the analyte, amount of the substance present in the analyte. In order to find out the amount of the substance present in the analyte, in order to measure the amount of the substance in the analyte, we use standard relationships. That is 1 cm cube of 1 molar solution of any chemical substance is equal to 1 millimole of any chemical substance. That is for example, if you remember the determination of hardness of the water sample, we say 1 cm cube of 1 molar EDTA solution. EDTA is the one which is used as a standard solution there in that experiment. 1 cm cube of 1 molar EDTA solution is equivalent to 1 millimole of calcium carbonate. That means 1 cm cube of 1 molar EDTA can interact with 1 millimole of calcium carbonate. In this way, for various chemical species, we have established practically proven 
chemical relationships. So, whichever the titrant we are using, whichever the analyte we are using, accordingly we use this kind of the relationship. 1 cm cube of 1 molar solution of any chemical substance is equal to 1 millimole of any chemical substance. For example, 1 cm cube of 1 molar EDTA solution is equal to 1 millimole of or 100 milligrams of calcium carbonate. If it is so, this much cm cube of, we know the volume of titrant right during the titration at the end point. So, this much cm cube of, this much molar because we also know the concentration of titrant, this much cm cube of, this much molar EDTA is equal to this volume into molarity into 100 milligrams of calcium carbonate. Thereby, we can calculate the amount of calcium carbonate present in 25 cm cube of the given analyte sample when we are carrying out that titration as an example. In this way, for any titration experiment, once we know the end point, we will be knowing the volume of the titrant consumed during the course of titration, we will also be knowing its concentration by using those two values, we can find out the concentration of analyte by using this kind of the relationship relating to those particular titrants and the analytes. Similarly, we can also use the concentration in terms of normality that is 1 cm cube, we can use this in, we can use this kind of the relationship if the titration we are carrying out, if it is a complexometric titration or a molecular reaction, if it is other kind of the reaction, ionic reaction, etc., then we go for 1 cm cube of 1 normal solution of any chemical substance is equal to 1 milli equivalent of any chemical substance. For example, one if you in the, if you remember the COD experiment, there we, we take this 1 cm cube of 1 normal potassium decrement is equal to 8 milligrams of oxygen or 1 cm cube of 1 normal FAS is equal to 8 milligrams of oxygen or 1 cm cube of 1 normal FAS is equal to 1 cm cube of 1 normal potassium dichromate solution. So, in this way by using any of these relationships depending upon whether we are carrying out the complexometric reactions or molecular reactions or some other kind of the reactions, once the reaction is over, once the titration is over, we will be knowing what is the volume of the titrant consumed during the course of titration. We will also be knowing concentration of the titrant by using these two values with the help of these relationships further we can easily calculate concentration of analyte in the given chemical solution. So, therefore, in this way by using volumetric analysis technique or titrimetric analysis, we will be able to find out the concentration of analyte or we will be able to estimate the analyte in the given chemical solution. So, what we do for that? We take the titrant standard solution as a titrant in the burette and we take known volume of the analyte in the conical flask, we take the help of suitable indicator to find out the end point, we carry out volumetric titration by adding solution from the burette into the conical flask along with the continuous swirling of the flask, we find out the end point with the help of the indicator by observing the color change and uh, the amount uh, and the end point is nothing but uh, the point where all the analyte in the conical flask is completely reacted with the titrant. What is the amount of the titrant? What is the volume of the titrant required to react with the requ uh, given amount of known amount of the analyte we are finding out in such a way, in such way? Finally, by using this relationship, we will be knowing what is the amount of the analyte reacted. Uh, sorry, what is the amount of the titrant reacted? We know what is the concentration of the titrant. We know. So, by using this, with the help of these standard relationships, we will be able to calculate or estimate the analyte in any given chemical solution. So, this is the overall idea behind volumetric analytical technique or titrimetric analytical technique. This is generally called as volumetric analysis and I already told you why it is called as volumetric analysis. Now, uh, in order to carry out this volumetric analysis or titrimetric analysis, what are all the basic requirements? What are all the basic requirements? Basic requirements are, you know that while we carry out some titration experiments, some titration experiments we carry out normally. In during some other titration experiments, we uh, heat the 
analyte solution to certain extent. Thereby, we carry out uh, the titration under hot condition. Some other titration experiments, we carry out the titration under cold conditions. So, therefore, why we need to do so? Why we need to do so? The first requirement is we have to by trial and error method, experimental conditions are being proven or for any new experiment, we have to we have to choose a we have to choose a proper experiment condition for the titration and we have to choose a right indicator so that so that the difference between the actual end point actual equivalence point and the visual end point must be very very small what is the meaning of this you are carrying out the titration you are observing you are adding solution from the burette you are carrying out the titration in a conic uh, and you are swirling the flask continuously along with the addition of the solution from the burette and taking the help of the indicator once the color change is observed that is the end point. For example, if you remember the de determination of hardness the color change is what wine red to clear blue wine red to clear blue. So, for us when we are doing the experiment for us when we are analyzing in the laboratory for us the end point is what for us the end point is wherever we observe the color change. The point here is wherever we observe the color change that is the end point for us that is what is called as visual end point. We cannot we cannot we cannot observe at all whether the reaction is completely completed with how the ions are moving how the atoms are reacting we cannot observe that. But we can come to know about the completion of the reaction only by observing the color change. Therefore, it is called as visual end point. Visual end point and the actual completion of the reaction, actual equivalence point of the reaction must be almost same or the difference between those two must be very, very less. In that way only we have to choose the proper experimental conditions and we have to choose the proper indicator. Otherwise, what may happen is what if you are not choosing the proper experimental condition and proper indicator what may happen is color change may occur before the completion of the reaction or color may color change may occur after some sometime after the completion of the reaction in that case the result will not be accurate so therefore the visual end point and the actual end point must be almost same or the difference between those two must be very very less in that way we have to choose the proper experimental conditions and proper indicator. That is the reason I think you know that same indicator cannot be used for all the experiments for different solutions we use different indicators number one and some experiments we carry out under hot condition, some experiments we carry out we carry out the heating, some experiments we carry out under cold conditions and so on because in those conditions only the actual end point and the visual end point are almost one and the same first condition, first requirement for any titration. Second titration, second condition, second requirement is the reaction between the titrant and the analyte. We are adding titrant from the burette, conical flask analyte is taken, we are adding the solution from the burette, it reacts with the analyte taken in the conical flask. The reaction between those two must be rapid, must be rapid. If the reaction is very slow, or if the reaction is reversible, then it will be really difficult for us to find out the accurate end point. If the reaction is very slow or if the reaction is reversible, in that case what may happen is uh, reaction is very slow, you are adding the titrant, but the reaction occurring very slowly. So, therefore, what happens? Uh, you are suppose imagine you need to add uh, only 10 ml of the titrant is required to react completely with the analyte you are adding 10 ml that is enough actually, but because the reaction is very slow, because the reaction is very slow, reaction is not at over, indicator is not showing, showing the color change because the reaction is not at over, because it is slow. Therefore, we feel that reaction is not at over, we feel that we need some more titrant to for titrant for this react uh, for the reaction to be completed. Therefore, we will be adding some more amount of the titrant. Therefore, we carry out over titration will be ending up with the wrong result. That is the reason whenever we go for volumetric analysis another requirement is whatever the titrant and whatever the analyte we choose they, they undergo reaction with each other as rapidly as possible. And the third condition is third requirement is 
the reaction between the titrant and the analyte must be quantitative. Quantitative means whatever the titrant you are adding, the titrant must be reacting only with the analyte. There must, there should not be any side reactions. There should not be presence of any other chemical which interferes with the, which interferes with the major reaction. If there are any side reactions, what happens? A part of the titrant will be taken away by the side reactions. Therefore, more amount of titrant is going to be consumed, will be ending up with the wrong result. Another problem is there are, there may be some substances present in the uh, analyte mixture, they may interfere with the major course of the reaction. When they interfere with the major course of the reaction, then also some part of the analyte the titrant is going to be wasted. That is the reason the reaction between the titrant and the analyte must be quantitative. There must, there should not be any side reaction and there should not be any substance which is present which is able to interfere with the major reaction. These are the three major requirements we have to consider while carrying out, before carrying out any volumetric titration. If we do not consider these three conditions, these three requirements, if we do not fulfill these three requirements, then the result will not be accurate. We are not going to get the right result. First condition is the experimental condition and the indicator should be chosen in such a way that uh, the, there must be a very small difference between the visual end point and the actual end point. Second important parameter is reaction between the titrant and the analyte must be rapid. If it is very slow, we are going to end up with the over titration, higher titration value we are going to report. Third one is there should not be any side reaction and there should not be any, any substance in the reaction mixture, in the analyte mixture which interferes with the major chemical reaction occurring between the titrant and the analyte. So now coming to what are all the different terms we are using in the preparation of the solution. Because while carrying out volumetric analysis, we already understood that analyte will be taken in the conical flask whereas titrant will be taken in the burette. And titrant is always a solution of known concentration. So, when a solution of known concentration is there, we need to prepare the solution of known concentration or we need to prepare the standard solution. So, while preparing that solution, what are all the terms we use? One term we use, very common term, solute. Solute is the, solute is the compound, generally in the solid state, sometimes maybe in the liquid state also, it will get dissolved easily in the uh, required solvent, thereby uh, required solvent thereby uh, leading to the preparation of the standard solution. Solvent is the one, solvent is generally in the liquid state, liquid state, sometimes maybe generally in the liquid state and it will be able to dissolve the solute in itself easily. A solution is the one, a solution is the chemical mixture we can say or chemical species or chemical mixture which is formed out of the dissolution of solute in the given solvent. Whereas a standard solution is the one whose concentration is known to us. A standard solution is always prepared by dissolving known weight of the solute in known volume of the solvent. So, while preparing the standard solution what we do? We take known weight of the solute in the solid state generally, sometimes maybe in the liquid state also. In that case, we may take in terms of weight or in we may take in terms of volume. So, we take known weight of the solute in the solid state, we dissolve that in the solvent in of known volume. To in order to prepare standard solution, we take the help of what is called as volumetric flask or it is also called as standard flask. We take the help of what is called as volumetric flask or standard flask. A volumetric flask will be having a long neck structure like this, there will be a mark on the neck and volumetric flask may be of 50 ml capacity or 100 ml capacity or 250 ml capacity whatever it is. So, what we do? We, dis we take the crystal uh, known weight of the solute into the co in uh, with the help of a funnel, we take the known weight of the crystal into the crystal or solute into the standard flask or volumetric flask, then we add water or any other suitable solvent we dissolve it, once we, after dissolving it, we make the solution up to the mark. When you add up to the mark, exactly it is going to be 100 ml, if it is 100 ml flask, it is going to be 50 ml, if it is 50 ml flask, 
it is going to be 250 ml it is, if it is 250 ml flask. In this way we are preparing standard solution of known volume. We may prepare 50 ml standard solution if we require only 50 ml. We may prepare 100 ml standard solution if we require only 100 ml or if we may prepare 250 ml standard solution if we prepare to if we need 250 ml. So, in this way by dissolving known weight of the solute in known volume of the solvent by take in a volumetric flask we prepare standard solution. So, therefore, while preparing standard solution while preparing a solution uh, to be used as a titrant uh, in during any volumetric analysis we need we usually use the terms most common terms frequently solute, solvent, solution and standard solution. And these chemical solutions which are being used in volumetric analysis they are of two types one is primary standard solution and secondary standard solution. So, what we what we are trying to understand here while carrying out volumetric analysis we need a titrant which is generally a standard solution. How to prepare the standard solution we understood and while preparing the standard solution we come across the terms frequently like solute, solvent, solution, standard solution etcetera. And when we prepare these standard solutions, these standard solutions are of two types one is called as primary standard solution another one is called as secondary standard solution. What do we mean by a primary standard solution and how what are all the cares what are all the steps to be taken while preparing a primary standard solution and what do we mean by a secondary standard, secondary standard solution we try to understand now. A primary standard solution is the one which is prepared by using a chemical which is having high purity a chemical of sufficient purity from which a standard solution is prepared directly is called as a primary standard solution. That is if you are having a chemical which is having sufficient purity there are no much impurities by using that chemical of sufficient purity if you prepare a standard solution then that kind of the standard solution is what is called as primary standard solution. So, therefore, uh, th this is what is called as primary standard solution and what are all the requirements? What are all the requirements to prepare a primary standard solution? For the first requirement is the substance must be chemically pure that is what is already told impurities in the substance should not exceed 0 0.01 to 0 0.02 percent. So, in order to prepare a primary standard solution whichever the substance you are using whichever the solute you are using it must be chemically pure the impurities present in that substance must not exceed exceed 0 0.01 to 0 0.02 percent. If the impurities are present beyond this much beyond 0 0.0 percent what happens is these impurities may interfere with the activity of the uh, chemical main chemical substance thereby the entire purpose will be damaged entire purpose will be lost. So, that is the reason whenever the chemical is highly pure by using high, highly pure chemical when we prepare the primary standard solution or any standard solution then we call it as primary standard solution then what happens when we carry out the titration experiment whatever the extent of reaction we are expecting from the standard solution that much of the reaction that much of the reaction the extent of reaction what we are expecting that much of the reaction will be practically there thereby the result will be accurate and the entire process will be completed in that case only the visual end point will al al almost will be equal to the practical actual end point that is the reason first requirement is the substance must be highly pure. The second requirement for the preparation of primary standard solution is the composition of the chemical must be exactly same as its molecular formula. For example, you are preparing copper sulphate solution. Copper sulphate if you look at the molecular formula of copper sulphate it is going to be CuSO4 dot 5 H2O there are 5 molecules of water of hydration are there in copper sulphate. So, when you are using copper sulphate crystal to prepare the solution whatever the copper sulphate compound of the crystal you are using that also must be having same composition CuSO4 dot 5 H2O composition 
are, must be there in the compound you are using. Otherwise, the you are calculating the normality or molarity of that solution, molarity or normality of that solution by assuming that by assume by taking the molecular mass by taking the molecular mass with respect to its chemical formula, molecular formula. But in actual practice, whatever the chemical you are using, if it does not have the same composition, then the, there will not be match, there will not be match between the actual concentration of the solution and the calculated concentration, then the results will not be accurate. That is the reason. The second requirement is the composition of the chemical must be exactly same as that of its molecular formula. That is water of hydration of crystalline salt should be same as mentioned in the formula as one of the examples. So, otherwise if the formula is different but actual composition is different, if that is so, the result will not be, will never be accurate because we calculate the normality or molarity of the solution by assuming that the given chemical compound is having same composition as that of its chemical formula. So, that care we have to take. The third requirement is the chemical whatever we are using for preparation of the primary standard solution must be stable on keeping both in solid form or in solution form. So, it should, it should be stable, it should not undergo any decomposition, any change with respect to its chemical composition upon keeping for long time, at least for, at least for a reasonable time period, it must be stable with respect to its chemical composition, whether it is in the solid state or in the solution state, both the states it must be stable with respect to its chemical comp chemical composition. Otherwise, what may happen is you are preparing a standard solution, primary standard solution, keeping it for some time. So, if it undergoes any change, any chemical, any change with respect to its composition, uh, decomposition, something like that, then you will never be able to get the right result by using that kind of the standard solution. So, therefore, the third condition is it must be stable on keeping. The fourth requirement is chemical should not be altered during the weighing. So, while preparing standard solution what we do? We take the exact, we carry out the weighing of the solute, right? While preparing the standard solution, what we do is we carry out the weighing of the standard solution, we take the crystals and we take the, we take some, 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 some amount of crystal in a weighing bottle, we keep it in the uh, weighing balance and we carry out the weighing. Whenever we do so, the crystals will be exposed to the atmosphere. If these crystals are, if these chemical compounds are hygroscopic, what they do? They absorb the moisture from the atmosphere, thereby they undergo chemical change. Or if these chemicals are highly reactive, they may react with oxygen, they may react with carbon dioxide, thereby they may undergo, they may undergo chemical change during that process. That is the reason the chemical should not be altered during the weighing. They, they must be stable, they must not be that much reactive, they should not be hygroscopic, they should not interact immediately under normal conditions with air or carbon dioxide, etcetera. The fifth requirement is molecular mass of the chemical must be as large as possible. In order to prepare the primary standard solution, whichever the compound you are using to prepare primary standard solution, molecular mass must be larger. Because when the molecular mass is larger, this will reduce in the weighing errors. So, in order to prepare 0 0.0, 0 0.1 normal solution or 0.1 molar solution, etc., when the molecular mass is larger, we need to take usually reasonably more amount of the solute. When more amount of the solute is taken during weighing, weighing error will be less. So, that is the reason uh, molecular mass of the chemical must be as large as possible while preparing primary standard solution. And that is the reason while taking the salt also, while taking the chemical compound during uh, to carry out the weighing also, we have to take reasonable amount of the compound in order to prepare the standard solution. So, therefore, because the precision in weighing is around 0.1 to 0.2 milligrams, therefore, the weight of the sample should be at least 0.2 grams in order to reduce the weighing errors. This is another requirement. The last requirement is the chemical must be readily soluble in the solvent. In whichever the solvent we are preparing the standard solution, in that solvent whichever the chemical we are using that must be readily soluble. A sol uh, dissolution must be easier. So, that is another requirement we look 
uh, into the chemical whenever we try to prepare the primary standard solution. Therefore, among the standard solutions there are two different categories primary standard and secondary standard. A primary standard solution is the one which is prepared by using a sufficient, sufficiently pure chemical compound. In order to prepare the primary standard solution, there are some requirements. First requirement is the, the substance must be highly pure. Second requirement is the composition of the chemical must be same as its chemical formula. Third requirement is the chemical should be stable even up, upon keeping either in the solid state or in the solution state. The fourth requirement is chemical should not be altered during the weighing. Fifth chem, uh, requirement is its molecular formula must be larger, as large as possible and the sixth requirement is the chemical should be able to undergo dissolution easily in the given solvent. These are the requirements of a primary standard solution. These are the requirements for any chemical to be used while preparing a primary standard solution. If it is so, what is a secondary standard solution? For example, we have a chemical with you the chemical is not having is not able to meet the requirements to be used in pre, to be used in preparing primary standard solution chemical is not that much pure chemical is not that much um, stable and all those things in that case we cannot use that chemical in while preparing or to prepare a primary standard solution in that case what we do in such cases we prepare the standards we prepare a solution we have a chemical imagine we have a chemical that chemical is not able to fulfill the requirements to be used as a chemical to prepare primary standard solution in that case what we do we, pre, we dissolve that chemical in the known volume of the solvent and to prepare a solution of approximate concentration of approximate we do not know the exact concentration we will be having some idea okay this much of chemical is dissolved in this much of the solvent thereby the normality or the molarity is this much. In that way we prepare the solution. So, we prepare the solution of approximate concentration. Then what we do after preparing the solution of approximate concentration, approximate concentration means what? You are having a chemical compound which cannot be used for preparing the primary standard solution because it does not, does not fulfill those conditions. Therefore, that chemical, you, that kind of the chemical what we do? We take known weight of that chemical, dissolve in known volume of the solvent, thereby we get a solution, but we cannot call it as a standard solution. Because though we know the weight of the solute, though we know the volume of the solvent, we cannot call it as a standard solution because the solute will not be completely converted into the solution because it may be hygroscopic in nature or its composition may not be same as its chemical formula. So, because of all those things just by in this case in such cases just by knowing the weight of the solute dissolved in known volume of the solvent we cannot calculate the accurate normality. Therefore, we can only say that this kind this solution is of only approximate concentration. So, therefore, what we do in such cases of the chemicals we prepare solution of approximate concentration then what we do we titrate this solution against any suitable primary standard solution thereby we calculate its exact concentration. This kind of the standard solution is what we call as secondary standard solutions. For example, hygroscopic salts like NaOH or HCl standard solutions are prepared as secondary standard solutions only because NaOH or HCl do not fulfill the requirements of uh, primary standard chemical compound. So, therefore, in the case of such chemicals where we cannot use them to prepare primary standard solutions, we prepare a solution of approximate concentration, then we titrate those solutions against suitable primary standard solution, thereby we measure its, measure its accurate concentration. We measure its accurate concentration and we use it for some time and we cannot keep it for long, the secondary standard solutions we cannot keep it for long time. We have to measure its concentration, we have to use in the short span of time. Otherwise, because of its nature to undergo some chemical change, the concentration may change after some time. That is the reason these secondary standard solutions should be prepared and used as early uh, in, in as short period as possible. So, this is what about primary standard solutions and secondary standard solutions. Now, we see what are all the units we are 
using in order to uh, express the concentration of various standard solutions. We are talking about standard solutions, primary standard solutions, secondary standard solutions. A standard solution is the one whose concentration is known. What are all the units we are using in expressing the concentration of standard solutions? One of the units is molarity. Molarity is the term we use in expressing the concentration of any solution while the titrations uh, while the tit those titrations are either are involving are involving complex reactions or molecular reactions complex formation or molecular reactions whenever we carry out the titrations where the reactions are either complex formation reactions or the reactions are molecular reactions in nature in such cases the concentration of the titrant is expressed in terms of molarity we may call it as one molar solution 0.5 molar solution and so on. What do you mean by this molarity? Molarity is nothing but number of moles of the substance dissolved in 1 liter of the solvent is called what is called as molarity. Number of moles of the substance dissolved in 1 liter of the solvent is what is called as molarity or other way around 1 gram, 1 gram molecular mass of the solvent, 1 gram molecular weight of the substance dissolved in 1 liter of the solvent gives us 1 molar solution, one molar concentration solution. I repeat once again, molarity is nothing but number of moles of this solute dissolved in one liter of the solvent is nothing but molarity and one, whenever one gram molecular mass of the solvent, solute dissolved in one liter of the solvent, the resultant solution we call it as one molar solution. For example, if you take one liter of one molar, di suppose if it's 1 liter of 1 molar disodium salt of EDTA solution is prepared by dissolving 1 gram molecular mass of disodium salt of EDTA that is 372 grams in 1 liter of the water. That means what? Molecular mass of disodium salt of EDTA is 372. If you exactly take 372 grams of the EDTA, we call it as 1 gram molecular weight. Therefore, if you dissolve 372 grams of EDTA crystals in 1 liter of the water, the resultant solution will be having concentration of 1 molar, concentration of 1 molar. This is the meaning when we say 1 molar solution. This is the meaning when we say by dissolving 1 gram molecular mass of the substance in 1 liter of the water, we get 1 molar concentration solution. Similarly, when we are uh, carrying out neutralization, neutralization titrations or redox titrations, we use the term normality to express the concentration of the standard solutions. What do you mean by normality? We call it as one normal solution, 0.5 normal solution and so on. So what do you mean by normality? Normality is nothing but number of equivalents of the substance dissolved in one liter is called as normality. How many number of gram equivalents of the substance dissolved in 1 liter is what we call as normality. Or other way around, if we are dissolving 1 gram equivalent weight of the substance in 1 liter of the solvent, then we call it as one normal solution. I repeat once again, if we dissolve 1 gram equivalent weight of the substance in 1 liter of the water or 1 liter of the solvent, we call it as one normal solution. For example, for example, if you take potassium dichromate, Potassium dichromate's equivalent weight is 49. Therefore, if you take exactly 49 grams of the potassium dichromate, we call it as 1 gram equivalent weight. Therefore, if you dissolve 49 grams of the potassium dichromate crystals in 1 liter of the water, we get 1 normal potassium dichromate solution. 49 grams means what? 1 gram equivalent mass of potassium decremate is nothing but 49 grams. If that much is dissolved in 1 liter of the water, the resultant solution is have, will be having the concentration of 1 normality. Therefore, 1 normal potassium decremate solution we call it as. Whereas, uh, the molecular mass of potassium decremate is 294. If you dissolve 294 grams of, that is 1 gram molecular mass of potassium decremate, if you dissolve 294 grams of potassium decremate in 1 liter of water, the resultant solution we call it as 1 molar potassium decremate solution or we can also call it as 6 normal potassium decremate solution because 49 into 6 is equal to 294. Therefore, you are dissolving in terms of equivalent mass, you are dissolving 6 gram, 6 
gram equivalent mass of potassium decrement in 1 liter. Therefore, the concentration is going to be 6 normal, whereas in terms of molarity, it is going to be only 1 molar. Whereas, if you take the example of ferrous ammonium sulphate, for ferrous ammonium sulphate, normality and molarity are one and the same because for ferrous ammonium sulphate, molecular mass is same as equivalent mass. Therefore, for a ferrous ammonium sulphate, its molecular mass is 392, its equivalent mass is also 392. If you dissolve 392 grams of ferrous ammonium sulphate crystals in 1 liter of the water, we call it as 1 normal ferrous ammonium sulphate solution or we can also call it as 1 molar ferrous ammonium sulphate solution. Depending upon what kind of reaction we are carrying out during the volumetric titration, uh, by using FAA standard solution, we, uh, we can either express its concentration in terms of molarity or normality. So, now another term we use while expressing the concentration of standard solutions is molality. While expressing concentration of any standard solution in terms of molarity or normality, as you remember, molarity is nothing but number of moles of the solute dissolved in 1 liter of the solvent. Similarly, the normality is nothing but number of gram equivalents dissolved in 1 liter of the solvent. So, there in both the cases, the solvent is taken, taken in terms of 1 liter is taken in terms of volume. But the volume sometimes may change with change in temperature and pressure, volume of the solvent thereby entire volume of the solution may change with temperature and pressure. In such cases, when we express concentration in terms of normality or molarity, when the temperature or there is if there is a considerable change in temperature or pressure, volume changes thereby whatever the molarity or normality concentration, whatever the concentration we calculate in terms of normality and molarity may not be accurate, may get changed. In such a case, we go for the term called as molality in order to express the concentration of the solutions. Molality is nothing but number of moles of the solute dissolved in 1 kg or 100 grams of the solvent. In some cases, in some cases where there is more chance for changes in the volume of the solution occurs, where, where, are, where there are more chances, in such case, instead of molarity or normality, we go for molality. Molality is nothing but number of moles of the solute dissolved in 1 kg or 100,000 grams of the solvent. And unit of molality is moles per kg. 1 mole of the substance dissolved in 1 kg of the solvent is called as 1 molal solution. 1 mole of the substance dissolved in 1 kg of the solvent is called as 1 molal solution. For example, if you dissolve 372 grams of EDTA in 1 liter of water, then we call it as 1 molar solution of EDTA. Suppose if you dissolve 1, 372 grams of EDTA in 1 kg of water, for that matter 1 kg in 1 liter, almost one and the same under the normal condition in the case of water under standard conditions. So, still if you are taking in terms of kg, 1 kg of water, then we call it as 1 molal solution. So, this is about molality. Therefore, normality, molarity, molality, these are the three major terms while expressing the concentrations of standard solutions in during volumetric analysis. Another term we use is what is called as mole fraction. Mole fraction is also the term used to express the concentration. Mole fraction is very simple to understand. Mole fraction is nothing but number of moles of that chemical species divided by total number of moles of the solute and the solvent. When we talk about any solution, a solution is a combination of solute and the solvent, right? A, a solution is a combination of solute and the solvent. So, in, a, in any solution, certain number of moles of solute will be present, certain number of moles of solvent will be present and therefore, mole fraction of any given chemical substance is nothing but the ratio of the number of moles of that substance to the total number of moles present in that particular solution. For example, for mole fraction of the solute is equal to, therefore, mole fraction of solute is equal to number of moles of the solute divided by total number of moles of solute and the solvent. Uh, similarly, number uh, mole fraction of solvent is equal to number of moles of that solvent divided by 
total number of total number of moles of solute and the solvent this is how mole fraction is calculated for any uh, for the mixture of any two or more chemical substances in any solution two or more chemical substances are present mole fraction of any given chemical substance is nothing but the ratio of number of moles of that substance to the total number of moles of total number of moles of all the substances present in the mixture but we are talking about the solution here the two standard solution a solution is a combination of solute and the solvent therefore we are confining the meaning of mole fraction to a solution only therefore mole fraction of a solute is equal to mole fraction number of moles of solute divided by total number of moles of the solute and the solvent and the mole fraction of solvent is equal to number of moles of solvent divided by total number of moles of the solvent and the last one is parts per million whenever the concentration of any species is very very less in such a case we express the concentration in terms of parts per million very smaller concentrations are always expressed in terms of parts per million it is one part of chemical substance in million parts of the solvent out of million parts of the solvent one part of the chemical substance in million parts of the solvent is nothing but parts per million for example you know uh, hardness of the water is expressed in terms of ppm of calcium carbonate so parts how many uh, ppm how many uh, calcium carbonate uh, or calcium ions are present in uh, per million part of the water we expressed in terms of ppm of calcium carbonate therefore whenever the concentration is very very less we express the concentration in terms of parts per million parts per million is given by parts per million is equal to mass of the solute by mass of the solvent into 10 to the power of 6 so how much of the solute is present how much of the solute is present for uh, in in the given mass of the solvent into 10 to the power of 6 will give you parts per million of the parts per million concentration of the solute for dilute aqueous solutions 1 ppm is nothing but 1 milligram of the solute in 1 kg of the solvent or 1 liter of the solvent for dilute solutions 1 ppm is nothing but 1 milligram of the solute present in 1 kg or 1 liter of the solvent in this way whenever we come across very smaller concentrations we express the concentration in terms of parts per million so therefore overall in this particular session where we discussed about volumetric analysis volumetric analysis we understood what do we mean by volumetric analysis what do we mean by volumetric analysis why it is called as volumetric analysis only what kind of solutions we use in carrying out volumetric analysis what is the uh, what is the meaning of a titrant what is the meaning of an analyte and uh, why titrant uh, is, is generally taken as a, st a standard solution is always taken as a titrant we understood what is the end point what do we mean by end point of a titration and uh, how do we uh, get the help of an indicator to uh, uh, find out the exact end point what are the basic requirements of any titration procedure we gone through that and uh, we also gone through the terms we generally used we generally use while preparing a solution solute solvent solution standard solution etc how to prepare a standard solution we understood then we gone through two different kinds of standard solutions primary standard and secondary standard we gone through what are all the requirements in order to prepare a primary standard solution where we understood that how important it is to consider all those points while preparing a primary standard solution because when the primary standard solution is proper result will be accurate because for us the accurate result is more important and wherever it is not possible for us to prepare a primary standard solution with with certain chemical we go for secondary standard solution and secondary standard solutions accurate concentration also we find out with the help of suitable primary standard solution we understood then we finally gone through what are all the units common units we use in expressing concentration while carrying out volumetric titration where uh, the molarity normality molality where we use the term molality and what is mole fraction and what is parts per million 
where we where do we use parts per million etc we understood so therefore at the end of the session we have a fair idea about the entire concept of volumetric titration and its implications its result why it is used how it is how it can be used accurately efficiently we try to understand in this particular session thank you